Section 11.4, we're going to basically see how we uh, actually made many of the discoveries that uh, we talked about previously. You know, these are particle accelerators and, and what they are quite simply are particle factories. They allow us to achieve energies that aren't necessarily uh, seen commonly now in the universe. And it allows us to create these particles from the past of very high energy and very high, which exist at very high temperatures. And of course, uh, once we create them, we also need to detect them. We need to be able to determine what exactly um, we're seeing when we, uh, we, we create these things. So uh, we'll talk about what the goal of the particle accelerator really is, and then we'll talk about um, some detectors. Obviously, this could be a course onto itself, so we're going to be a little bit limited in uh, the scope of, of what we go over. Uh, we'll look at one of the most powerful uh, particle accelerators, and that, of course, is the Large Hadron Collider, and look at an example of what a detector at um, the Large Hadron Collider. This is the Atlas Collider detector, what that looks like. So, once again, why do we need a particle accelerator? Again, the idea of a particle accelerator is basically e equals mc squared. It's to convert the energy, the work that we do, by taking uh, particles, you know, usually electrons, protons, um, sometimes even antimatter particles like positrons and antiprotons, accelerating them very close to the speed of light so they have a lot of energy, and then smashing them together. And from the collision, we should be able to convert some of that energy into mass. So again, particle accelerators are used to do work on these particles to create a lot of energy, but also to create particles during the collision that have very small wavelengths so we can look inside um, you know, the structure of, of different objects, you know, such as uh, you know, the quark, up and down quark, don't have very much energy, but we weren't able to discover them until the wavelengths of the particles that we use to probe inside the proton and neutron were sufficiently small. So let's take a look at the, you know, the particles, some of the important particles that, that we've covered so far. The electron um, only has a energy of half of mega electron volt. You know, that's of course the, uh, the, the energy if you do equals mc squared, that's where you see mega electron volt divided by c squared. And if we look at the proton and neutron, they're almost up to a giga electron volt uh, per speed of light squared. So, you know, again, normal matter is made out of those. So these are pretty good particles to choose to uh, use in these collisions. Now, again, up, down, and strange quarks, these were all discovered by the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And the proton and neutron were well within their you know, any accelerator for a proton and neutron, uh, it wouldn't be difficult to achieve these energies, but it was really getting to a small enough wavelength that we could uh, get to a realm smaller than the proton and neutron. And actually, instead of hitting the proton and neutron with uh, a particle, hit an individual quark and scatter off that to, uh, again, confirm the existence of these quarks. Of course, muons are actually created in our upper atmosphere, but um, as we got to higher and higher energies, we needed more and more powerful accelerators. The charm quark um, was also, I believe, discovered at Stanford, but to get to the, the bottom quark, the W, the Z boson, we just needed more and more powerful machines to do that. And of course, at the top of the list so far, we can see that the Higgs boson and the top quark are about 125 and 173 giga electron volts per C squared. But here's the thing, you can have a particle accelerator that can achieve those energies, but because we're conserving momentum also, it becomes actually difficult um, to produce these. So you actually have to far exceed the energies of the particles that you're looking at. Um, so again, here's the basic process if we want to keep it as simple as possible. We have these colliding particles that we're going to use. Maybe we're accelerating electrons. 
maybe we're accelerating protons. They have their own rest mass, mass associated, well, energy associated with their mass. And um, we can't just simply, you know, bump two particles into one another and expect anything significant to happen. We have to do a lot of work on these with the accelerators. We're actually putting them in electromagnetic fields to do work on them through the, the Lorentz force. And what we have are these, um, you know, nearly luminal particles, these particles that are nearly going at the speed of light, which have tremendously large energies associated with the rest mass is actually becomes insignificant compared to the um, the energy once you're traveling, you know, 99.9% of the speed of light. So here's a look at some of the accelerators, you know, throughout the years. And we can see, um, unfortunately, I hope this isn't cut off. You can see at the very top that uh, in giga electron volts, our large hadron collider, you know, pretty much approaches and exceeds in, in, in some cases that one tera electron volt um, realm. And that's the most powerful uh, collider in the world that's in Europe. Uh, that's in CERN. So that's sort of the, I don't know if you call it the gold standard of accelerators, but that is probably the premier accelerator in the world. We can see other accelerators. These in red typically accelerate um, protons. Um, the one in green, that's an electron proton collider. That's very interesting to do, to do uh, that type of collision. Um, the electron and the positron accelerators are shown in blue. And uh, heavy ion colliders, you just take a big, massive nucleus and collide into another one. Uh, that's the relativistic heavy ion collider, which was at Brookhaven. And there was also one at CERN using the Large Hadron Collider. So these are the different energies. And you can see throughout the world, throughout time, we've been getting to higher and higher energies. Um, and uh, these, of course, have led to the discovery of more and more energetic particles as a result. So, again, we can think of, you know, these energies as being um, important for two reasons. One, we're going to be able to produce heavier particles, e equals mc squared, heavier particles in the resulting collisions. Two, the wavelength of the particles colliding becomes smaller and smaller. So if we're doing something like the Stanford Linear Accelerator did, you know, look inside the um, the protons and the neutrons to find quarks, um, you need smaller and smaller wavelengths in order to do that and, and study them, okay? And it's important to note that uh, it's not so easy to just slam these particles together and say, I hit the right energy, or what we call resonance, and suddenly these particles magically fly out. You can have, I don't have experience with this, but you can have, you know, billions of collisions take place. And it's like the one in one billion uh, collision that actually produces uh, a, a, a new result, a good result for us. So um, the other problem that we run into is that uh, as these collisions become more and more energetic, we're producing more and more collisions that just result in ordinary particles, that those rare particles are less likely to be uh, found in some of these events. So they, they, they actually use computers to sit through. Um, I don't know how many, I said billions and I'm probably you know, off the mark there, but um, it's not possible just for a human being to look through these. You actually have to use computer analysis for this. So let's go back to this idea. We've got these particles. We want to give them a lot of energy. We want to accelerate them near the speed of light. Well, it's very simple. All we need to do is put them in an electric field. We can do work on a charged particle um, by saying the charge, usually they're singly charged, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, times the potential difference. Okay, we're going from a low, higher potential to a lower potential. So 
you know, delta V here is going to be negative. That's going to result in positive work and make this particle go faster. So um, we're really not doing anything, you know, more complicated than uh, what old CRTs used to do. Uh, the way a CRT would work is you'd put under a few thousand volts um, an electron in this potential. The electron would have work done on it. And of course, the electron would come out with a few kill electron volts of, of energy. That energy would be liberated when they hit a phos phosphor screen and that would leave uh, a trace. So the old CRTs would sweep this electron beam back and forth and um, the energy from the electrons, of course, would be uh, turned into light so we could actually see them. And for color television, they'd actually have three of these electron guns going through different grids so they would you know, create a red, green, and blue um, image and combine that to create color. Red, green, and blue phosphor. The, the actual color rendering would be done um, on a grid at the phosphor screen. Same thing with X-ray tubes. Um, you have an electron here accelerating at maybe 100 kilo electron volts. So these electrons are accelerated. It's a mini particle accelerator at, at about 100 kilo electron volts. They hit the target normally made out of tungsten. The, this energy would then be converted into X-ray energy, um, either through Bremster lung radiation, okay, you know, slowing down these uh, very energetic electrons, or what would happen is he'd knock off an inner electron and the outer electrons would cascade down and produce what are known as ca characteristic X-rays. So another, this is another example of a particle accelerator. There's particles in it, it's accelerating them and it's using that to create um, X-rays. But in terms of really, really getting to those high energies, we have, um, a problem where a single stage acceleration is limited, okay? Um, for instance, if, if I have um, a voltage, I have a potential difference, and I'm hitting about 2 million volts, okay? I want to accelerate that particle across that 2 million volts. At 2 million volts, we're getting to the point where um, we're getting coronal discharge. It's just going to self-discharge in the atmosphere. Even if I put it in a vacuum, you're pretty much limited to a few million volts. So here is the Atom Smasher, okay, cool name, uh, built in 1937. And it was just a massive, massive Van de Graaff generator and uh, had these big bolt, these big belts that would, would lift the charge onto the sphere. Then from the sphere, it would accelerate particles from this uh, down the center tube so it was sort of like this vertical shaft uh, for this accelerator. And um, it was, you know, it was quite impressive. It would, you know, hit um, potential differences of 5 million electron volts. So, you know, maybe five mega electron volts would be what we would get, um, you know, from the particles that, that were undergoing this acceleration. Um, but again, this is pretty much the limit on single stage, which means you've got one potential difference between two points. And again, we have this conservative force from the electric field, which is doing work on the particle and the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy as the particles accelerate. So how did we break this um, barrier? Well, um, what we needed to do is actually um, find ways to do multiple stages of acceleration. And um, the way a linear accelerator works is instead of just having one high voltage potential, it uses many high voltage uh, potentials to accelerate the particle. So, um, and, and there are other stages that, that, um, that happen in between this, uh, you know, with uh, the synchrotron, uh, but basically, you know, just going to the same sort of geometry, you know, the simplest geometry of just linearly accelerating a particle, um, you would use multiple potential differences 
and this concept of a drift to. So, you know, to, to achieve this, um, instead of just using a DC voltage, like you, you go back to this, this is a DC voltage. Um, you know, you always have a high voltage at one point, a low, low voltage at the other point, and that's kept relatively fixed. In the case of this, what you do is you actually use an oscillating electromagnetic field. You can use radio waves and microwaves, which oscillate back and forth. And the idea here was, let's say I've got a proton and I want to accelerate it. So at the phase where my microwaves electric field is pointing, this is polarized, is pointing in the positive X direction, my proton would accelerate. Okay, or if it's an electron, we, we'd have the reverse of the phase, but my particle, my charged particle accelerates. But it's an oscillating field, so it's going to change its polarity. So as the polarity changes, it's in a drift tube. This is a Faraday cage. This charged particle doesn't feel the negative phase of the oscillating electromagnetic field. But by the time it comes out the other end, the field's back to pointing in the positive x direction. Then it hides when it's in the negative x direction. Then it comes out when the electric field's back in the positive x direction. So I can keep boosting this successively. Now, obviously, you see what's happening here. The drift tube is getting longer and longer and longer, and the potential difference doesn't change, okay? So I'm getting less energy um, for greater and greater distances. So um, this is a linear accelerator. Again, we typically use micro... Uh, radio waves and microwaves to accelerate the um, particles. And uh, every time the particle passes through, it gets a little bit of boost, but eventually, of course, you're gonna run out of space and you can't accelerate the beam any further. So this is what we call lineac. And um, as I said, there are many different geometries that, uh, <laughs> that occurred you know, after the development of the atom smasher. and, and you know, Lawrence, of course, was working on his uh, cyclotron. Okay, so here's a Stanford linear accelerator. This is what discovered the uh, quarks up down in, in uh, Strange. And of course, this is uh, 3.2 kilometers long. And again, the quarks don't have that high of an energy. So we're not so much producing them, but we're scattering very, very small here, the Stanford linear accelerator used electrons, we're scattering very, very small wavelength electrons off these, these protons and neutrons to uh, you know map out what's inside them. And of course, at 90 gig electron volts, the, uh, the um, wavelength would be small enough to uh, uh, you know, see inside protons and neutrons. Um, you know, originally the Stanford linear accelerator just accelerated uh, electrons and they start accelerating electrons and positrons and then smashing them into one another. Um, and that would produce a collision energy of about 90 giga electron volts. Um, now, the cyclotron was another way of, um, of uh, accelerating particles, the cyclotron, the synchrotron. I've got to be a little bit careful with my terminology. And the idea here is instead of just accelerating them in a line, we could accelerate the particles in a circle and make them go faster and faster. The idea was here. We know that a charged particle will orbit in a circular path when placed in a magnetic field. You could then have an oscillating electric field created between these two plates, what we call D plates, and that would switch its polarity back and forth. Now, the way that this works is every time the particle would come between the two plates, okay? So like here, it would get a kick in this direction. Then the oscillating D would be in the other direction and it would get accelerated this way. You can keep seeing, go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and the particle would keep going over a larger and larger spiral till finally it spiraled outside the magnetic field. And that would be your beam of accelerated particles where the radius of curvature was equal to the momentum 
divided by the charge. Again, these are singly charged, single elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, and again, divided by the magnetic field. And again, um, this is a cyclotron invented by uh, Ernest Lawrence. He did this in 1929. And um, this actually predated the atom smasher that we showed before. And this is a really a good example of, of multi-stage you know, acceleration. Um, and it's really ingenious because you're accelerating accelerating these particles um you know inside this inside this sort of open geometry um in 1946 if you watched oppenheimer um they did show lawrence uh at uh you know in in california when uh he met uh, oppenheimer and lawrence uh was able to build this a 4.7 meter machine that uh, reached energies of 350 mega electron volts. So, um, you know, that was that was pretty significant in terms of uh, the energies that it was able to uh, achieve. So that is a cyclotron going around in a circle, you know, cycling, you know, circling, 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 and then come out. And the idea of a synchrotron is to extend this whole idea of, um, you know, these particles going around in a circle, but instead of a, you know, circular magnetic field that they're trapped in, they would actually take the circle and turn it into a ring. And um, this is one of the most popular geometries that we use today, the very powerful one. So it's, you know, in a way, it's really taking that cyclotron, cutting a hole in it, and just instead of keeping your magnetic field fixed, making your magnetic field increase as the particles are going faster and faster around this racetrack. So in 1944, Vladimir uh, Vestler uh, proposed using you know, such a geometry to expand the radius of the particles. Um, and this was uh, built in 1945. The problem that you have with, with the cyclotron, first of all, is that, um, because the particles are undergoing acceleration, they're going to lose energy through radiation. And we call this synchrotron radiation. As the particles go under you know, a higher and higher acceleration, they lose more and more of their energy. And eventually, um, if they're going around too tight of a path, uh, you can't put more energy into them than they're getting out. So this synchrotron radiation is actually used uh, to produce very, very short wavelengths. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting is in, in some cases, um, synchrotrons are used to accelerate particles to very, very high velocities um, to be used in colliders. In other cases, such as is done in Brookhaven right now, they use a synchrotron radiation to produce very, very intense shortwave radiation um, like uh, X-rays. But again, um, one thing that we will see is that particle accelerators get huge in size. The reason why they're so incredibly large is to eliminate the synchrotron radiation losses that uh, you know they'll normally undergo. And the, 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 you know we we do understand that centripetal acceleration, which causes the synchrotron radiation, centripetal acceleration goes by one over the radius of curvature. So the bigger we make these particle accelerators, the less synchrotron radiation that we're going to lose in this. And again, this is a Fermilab. These are the uh, uh, accelerators, uh, the synchrotron accelerators here. And uh, you can see they're, they're quite big. Um, this is a fairly tall building at Fermilab, sort of iconic for its shape. But uh, again, you can see um, part of a linear accelerator and uh, two uh, particle accelerators, which are part of the Tevatron, uh, which, uh, which is where they discovered the top quark. Now, this is the biggest machine uh, ever built uh, as far as particle accelerators go. This is the Large Hadron Collider. And it's underground. So um, just like this, they, they built it underground. 
I guess I should explain this a little bit. Um, I had the fortune of, of working at the particle accelerator at Los Alamos. It's a, it's a small lineac. And um, one thing that you, you learn very quickly is when that thing is operating, it generates a tremendous amount of radiation. So uh, what they do with these particle accelerators is they actually bury them below the ground to provide radiation shielding. And again, when that lineac was on at Los Alamos, you can go anywhere near the beam, okay? Um, in fact, uh, the beam would be diverted to different target areas. And if you wanted to work in a particular target area, that beam, which was being diverted there, had to be shut down. And there are all kinds of safety devices there to prevent people from being exposed to any radiation and big, thick concrete walls that protected us. Um, but again, they bury this underground and the target areas are actually not visible on the surface. And again, this is buried underground. So you see all this farmland on top and, and uh, you know, villages, they're completely safe. You know, it's not going to produce any radiation that's going to get um, out into the open. But again, here's some storage rings. Here's some, um, the larger ring. And then Atlas, which you're going to look at later, is the uh, target area. So um, first of all, we need to understand a little bit about um, beam optics. You know, you probably never thought that uh, you have to worry about uh, focusing a beam. But um, in many respects, a beam is very, very similar to a beam of light here. And we have to manipulate it and, and uh, correct for uh, a lot of problems that the beam had. Now, first of all, the simplest type of magnet is a dipole magnet, north and south pole. And of course, when we looked at the cyclotron, that was a very good example of an accelerator which had a dipole magnet, very powerful dipole magnet, but a dipole magnet where the particles would go around in a circle uh, within this field, perpendicular to the field, in fact. So a dipole magnet will steer a beam back or forth, or actually steer a beam uh, in a circular path. Uh, so they're gonna be very, very important for keeping the particle going around in a circle. So you have dipole magnets all around here to keep steering the, the, um, the particles around this, this racetrack, if you will. Same thing with this. And going back here, here's a big old pole. Here's a big old pole. So uh, this is a big north magnet. Here's a big south magnet. And then here are some of the iron connectors that help connect the magnetic field back. Um, so dipole magnets keep our beam going around in a turn. However, um, the beam will tend to have problems diverging or converging, and we need to be able to um, essentially correct for this, almost like we can correct for different you know, images uh, using lenses, okay? Now, here's the problem. How does one take a charged particle and focus it? You know, with, with light, it was easy because we had this dielectric material, and the dielectric material, of course, would um, you know change the speed of of the light, and uh, therefore allow you know the outer edges to get ahead or fall behind, you know, creating a focusing or defocusing type effect. Um, we don't have materials that do that for particles, um, so we need to come up with some type of analogy which is going to you know cause the beam to converge or diverge um, again to, to make corrections. And again, um, you know, I, I had some great advisors when I when I was an undergraduate. You know, they, they took me out to uh, work at Los Alamos. I actually got to, to, to uh, uh, focus the uh, beam to the target area using a bunch of quadrupole magnets. So it was uh, an interesting experience for me. So quadrupole magnets. Quadrupole magnets, they're not the solution, but they can be used in tandem to become the solution. See, a quadrupole magnet has an interesting magnetic field. You know, it's 
you know, very complex. If you look at the magnetic field up here, it's going to the right. If we look at the magnetic field here, it's going down. It's going left here. It's going up. Okay. So what would that effect be on, like, let's say, an electron beam? Well, here, what it would do is it would pinch the beam in the vertical direction, and it would stretch the beam in the horizontal direction. It would cause the beam to do this. So that's not really helpful for what I want to do. That's not taking my beam and making it focused or, or defocusing it, okay? So if I take two magnets and I sort of put them perpendicular to one another, um, I still have a problem where it will focus one way at some one distance, and then later on there'll be a second focus where the other dimension will, will focus. Like you'll get the horizontal focus here, then you'll get the vertical focus here. Not a great diagram that I drew, but um, you'll still get an aberration in this beam. So take a guess. I need three. I need a three quadrupole magnets linked together to focus equally in both dimensions. So, uh, you know, that's one of the, the, the important things that um, we need to understand with, the, with these particle accelerators. Not only are we, you know, doing work on the particles, causing them to um, go, you know, to higher and higher energies, as they are accelerated, they also start experiencing some aberrations. So there'll be these quadrupole magnets, which allow us to correct for some of the aberrations that um, you know we we run into, so you know it, it's a it, it's difficult um, to to keep these beams well behaved uh, as they're accelerated. Okay, so very simply, um, the particle accelerators we have these oscillating electric fields. Normally, they're being accelerated with um, you know very powerful microwaves. Uh, to uh, give them more and more energy. Um, there are even some accelerators which we're developing now that uh, use uh, uh, plasma and light to uh, create even higher accelerators, but uh, that's a little bit into the future on that. Um, we use dipole magnets to create the, the regular curvature of the beam. We use the quadrupole magnets to uh, do, you know, some some beam correction, and there's some even in some cases some higher order magnets to uh, to uh, do even more shaping to the beam. Okay, so now we have very energetic particles. What are we going to do with them? We're gonna smash them into one another, but we want to smash them together in a location that we can can um, pick up all the debris that's going to scatter off of them. And that's where the detectors come, come from. This is one of the detectors. Uh, this is the CMS detector at CERN on the Large Hadron Collider. And you can see it's a very, very complicated um, piece of equipment. And uh, there are multiple layers in here which are used to uh, detect um, different particles because different particles will behave differently and are, need different types of detectors to find them. Okay, so again, um, when we're analyzing these particles, we can use, again, we've already used dipole and quadrupole magnets to, to get the beam curved the way we want and shape the beam the way that we want it, but we can use other magnets to try to get an idea of what the momentum of the particles coming off the uh, collision are. So um, if I set the Lorentz force, saying that the magnetic field and the velocity are perpendicular, to the centripetal force, okay, I can solve for the radius of curvature, and thus the radius of curvature is going to tell me a lot about the particle. I know that the momentum of the particle is going to be equal to the radius of curvature times its charge. Almost everything is singly charged for the most part. We do have some doubly charged particles times the magnetic field. So um, if I see a particle coming off and it's placed in this magnetic field, that curvature is going to tell me 
a lot about the particle's uh, momentum, a lot about the particle's mass. The energy of a particle can be obtained a number of different ways. We call these calorimeters, but they're not calorimeters in, in the typical sense, the way that we think about calorimeters where we put them in a water bath. These calorimeters are usually some type of scintillating material that when you know um, particles of different energies, let's say like a, a gamma ray or, or an X-ray is produced, they have enough energy to cause these, um, these uh, uh, is this sodium iodide? Well, in any case, these uh, specialized materials to convert that energy into light. You can see, for instance, a gamma ray coming in will um, produce many secondary uh, particles. Here's, we have a positron and an electron, which the positron annihilates, produces more electron-positron pairs, but it keeps producing more and more different particles, which eventually give up their energy in the form of light. So um, in any case, if I track a particle and I want to see um, how much energy it has, these calorimeters can actually help me uh, make that determination. Remember, um, this is very much like coming to the scene of an accident where you've come to a traffic accident and you're trying to figure out what car was doing what, okay? We collide the particles, they send off the spray of, of, of uh, other particles. And we gotta you know, tally them all up find out how much energy they had, how much, um, you know, mass, momentum, everything. So um, in any case, uh, we need uh, both to, to determine energy and we also need to determine momentum. Um, normally, uh, we can use some type of, of tracing mechanism what they used to use are bubble chambers, which were um, uh, essentially they, you know, they started out with uh, uh, you know, super saturated um, vapor. Then they went to um, you know cryogenic liquids. As a particle would go through there, they give up some of their energy, and you you'd see a little trace of bubbles. That's that's the term, a bubble chamber. Um, now today they um, actually would use a lot of solid state uh, type of things just to keep track of a particle as it gave up its energy. And of course, this would track out a curve path if it were charged. And if it were not charged, it would give off a, a straight path. It's actually more complicated than just, you know, putting some uh, scintillators to find out their energy and putting some um, grids to uh, determine uh, their path. As you can see, this is the atlas, the, <laughs> I love this, to get an A in front of you, put A toroidal, Large Hadron Collider Apparatus. Wow, that's really as non-descriptive as you can get other than it's used on the Large Hadron Collider. But this is the, this is a really important uh, detector at one of the target areas that you can see. It's a very, very elaborate, uh, device that we have here. Now, um, let's let's take a look and see what uh, what this thing does um, from the target area. So the the particles are going to collide right here. The first thing that we have is a tracking detector that's going to be able to detect the movement of any charged particles that are that are going through there because. Uh, the charged particles will deposit some of their energy um, as they go through this particular medium. Um, uh, photons have no charge, so they're not picked up by this tracking detector. Um, neutral hadrons, you know, like a neutron, would not be detected by this. But anything charged, be it an electron, a positron, a muon, um, you know, any heavier uh, particles like uh, protons, uh, antiprotons, you know, we have a whole list of, of hadrons. Those are going to be initially picked up there. The next level is the electromagnetic calorimeter. Now, this one, uh, muons will just pass right through, protons and neutrons will pass right through. So this is not going to catch any of them. 
but this electromagnetic calorimeter, which is basically a scintillator, is going to pick up any gamma rays that are produced, um, electrons and positrons that are, are produced. So, um, you know, once we're able to, you know, figure out where these particles are going, our electromagnetic calorimeter is going to try to determine how much energy they have. After that, we have a hadronic calorimeter, as its name implies, you know, what gets through the first calorimeter is then captured by the second calorimeter, um, including, you know, charged and uncharged uh, hadrons. Um, after that, because muons are very, very, are very, very easy to penetrate things, there's a separate specialized muon uh, detector that can um, well, detect muons, you know, trace their path out and uh, determine what they are. So again, our tracking detector is shown in the yellow right here. Then we move out to uh, a large magnet, which is going to produce a magnetic field to curve the tracks because the next thing, uh, the first thing that we're doing was we're tracking, but the curvature is gonna be very, very important for de determining the momentum of the particles coming out. Then we have our electromagnetic calorimeter, okay? Shown in green right here, okay? All right, and now surrounding this will then be my hadronic calorimeter. And then finally, um, all the way out, we have our muon um, detectors, which, uh, you know, catch the muons that are, are so highly penetrated. Um, and again, you'll notice there are no neutrino detectors here. Neutrinos, they're just, they're so hard to stop that, um, you know, having any neutrino detectors, even if we catch a few, it's not going to really help us understand uh, what happened there. So um, that's our, our uh, you know, detector. And here you can see, um, in this case, we had a photon produced during the collision. Um, that was uh, that made its way to the the our electromagnetic calorimeter, as did um, this. I don't know why they have these overlapping. This electron right here, okay, and then our charged hadron, maybe a pion, could be a meson, it could be a baryon, made it here. Here's a neutral hadron. Um, that made it there it could be a neutron, uh, I don't know, lambda zero. And then finally, you have your muon that passed through everything is finally detected by these outer muon detectors. So um, these are very sophisticated devices. You know, many, many different types of detectors, you know, fit together into, you know, one, one region because we, we really have to determine what exactly was produced during the collision. We're, we're, we're tracing back in time. So we're tracing back in time exactly what happened here by seeing what is emerging from the collision. And uh, here is um, a diagram of all the different particles that were discovered during the discovery of the Higgs particle. And again, you can see uh, here for muons, here, you know, I can't even, you know, talk about all the different particles that are here. I believe, you know, if we're looking at our different layers here, looking at our different layers here, the hadronic calorimeter is on the outside, the electromagnetic calorimeter is on the inside. So here's our electromagnetic calorimeter picking up those electrons and photons. Here's her hadronic calorimeter picking up all the, uh, you know, all the baryons and mesons. So uh, there's a, a great example of, of uh, the discovery of a particle. But again, um, if you ran this machine and you, you looked at millions of, of these collisions, very few of them would be significant. Like this is really significant because this is a discovery a particle. Uh, so they literally have computers going through this and analyzing the data and saying, hey, this one is a candidate uh, that maybe should be analyzed further.
Okay. So um, once again, that is the whole idea of these particle accelerators. Again, um, giving particles a lot of kinetic energy. We're talking about relativistic kinetic energy. Again, we're hitting, you know, right below uh, the speed of light where gamma is going to be very, very high. Because if you're talking about the um, the Large Hadron Collider like this, um, which has, you know, a tera electron volt of energy during the collisions, um, you know, there's a, there's one of those colliders again, so you can sort of see the level, level of sophistication there, okay? Um, you're accelerating protons to tera electron volt levels, okay? Or not quite tera, but almost tera electron volt. If you think about it, going through our metric prefixes, kilo, mega, gigas, 10 to the nine, teras, trillion, 10 to the, 10 to the 12, okay? So a tera electron volt is a thousand times greater than a giga electron volt. We're talking about gammas that are over a thousand because your proton and your proton has just under a giga electron volt of rest mass energy. Uh, so you know, you know, when we calculate the energy of these particles during collisions, you know, we need them to hit tera electron volt. That means that you know. Going back to our relativity, gamma is going to be about a thousand. Okay. All right, folks, that's it for this.